welcome. Um, we are live at the moment to be discussing a really interesting um, synthesis and benchmarking of instant payment schemes across 12 jurisdictions. And I'm really excited to hear um, why instant payment schemes, what are the effective policy levers, when should policymakers advocate for interoperability, or if so, and how can interoperability be optimized for financial inclusion? There's a lot to, to, um, to learn here, but also we can see what's happening on the ground um, across different jurisdictions too, which is also great to learn. I'm joined today by um, the wonderful Shirley Mburu. Shirley is just sorting her internet connection out for the moment. It's a little bit unstable, so she's just trying to find somewhere a bit stronger so that we can see her as well as hear from her. Um, and for those of you that don't know um, Shirley, well, let me tell you a little bit more about Shirley. She is senior consultant at BFA Global. She leads the payments projects there and um, her portfolio includes leading interoperability feasibility and post implementation, implementation review studies. Um, and um, she's also managing various payment strategies efforts across East, Af East Africa, the latest being coordinating industry players towards the development of the current Kenya national payment systems business and strategy. She's obviously very um, experienced in the world of payments um, and interoperability, and I'm really delighted to have Shirley join us today. So welcome, Shirley. I hope we have a more stable internet connection. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Um, I've made a few switches. I hope it will work well. Brilliant. Thanks, I'm hearing you clear now, so that's wonderful. Um, so just before we begin, just a couple of quick housekeeping for me. Um, Shirley's going to give us a presentation the sort of that goes through the report and the synthesis that she's done. And we're expecting that to take about half of the webinar. And then obviously the second half is open to questions from you, the audience. So we'd love to hear those questions. If you could please put them in the Q&A function, which you'll find at the bottom menu on the Zoom functionality, that will help me see all the questions and, and add, ask as many as possible or discuss as many as possible with Shirley. Um, and also just to remind you all the webinar is being recorded and we will be circulating the recording to you on Thursday. So just in case you do have any connection issues like Shirley, um, <laughs> you can uh, watch the recording back. Or alternatively, if you really enjoyed today's session, which well, I'm pretty certain you're going to because I've, I think this is going to be a fantastic conversation, we'd love you to share that uh, webinar recording and, and have more people view today's session. Um, so thank you everyone that's joining us. We're up to a lovely number of attendees. So at this moment in time, um, I'm going to pass the, the baton over to Shirley. So shall I run your poll for you first, Shirley, as well? Yes, please. Let's start with the poll just to sort of whet their appetites and see what everyone is thinking. Fantastic. So the first poll or poll of today's um, Zoom uh, webinar should be up on your screens on Zoom or we've already had some people voting. So the question here is um, having a working domestic instant payment system is necessary to advance financial inclusion. You have one choice on a scale from strongly agree to strongly disagree. Um, so we would love to get an idea of what people think on this call. Um, oh, at the moment, Shirley, a lot of people are in the strongly agree or somewhat agree function. We've got a couple in others, so we'll give the poll another sort of 10 seconds or so for people to cast their vote um, before we see what the outcome is. So how many people, everyone has answered. Excellent. Um, here we go. So let me end the poll. All right. Um, and share the results. Here we go. So can you see the results, Shirley? Yes, I can see them. Excellent. So a lot of people strongly agreeing, which means we've got some, some, uh, some people that are going to ask some really interesting questions on today's webinar to, that are in alignment perhaps with some of the views that we have. But it will be really great to see um, how we change the, the five people who are not sure somewhat <laughs> disagree, whether their opinions change by the end of the webinar. I guess that's your challenge for today, right, Shirley? <laughs> yeah, and whether the ones that are in 75 or the other category actually change to the other categories, it will be great to see Please and hear. See. Okay, so I guess we can get started. Should I share my screen? Please do, Shirley, and let's get going. Thanks, Sarah. Great, let me know if you can see my screen. We certainly can. Okay, great. So very, very welcome to this session. Thanks for making time to um, take this journey with me. 
So this is a study we've been conducting on behalf of the Gates Foundation or other commissioned by the Gates Foundation. It started out in 2020, where we looked at the first six countries and then took a break of about six months and then continued with the next six countries last year. We are wrapping up the study. So this is the first time we've publicly, publicly presented so we'd really love your feedback either in the comment section or even you can reach out to me after this session. Um, it would be great to incorporate your feedback as we finalize the outputs. They'll be in the form of blogs, a series of blogs uh, that will capture different themes and topics that you will most certainly be interested in. And we'll also be publishing individual decks for the different countries so that you're able to get into some of the details and nuances that we may not be able to cover in this session. So great, so we'll start with the framing of the study. We started with three key questions that we aimed to answer. Let me just change something about my view. Great. Uh, so three key questions we aim to answer. And the first question is on the what. So what are the effective policy levers for achieving interoperability success? The second question we aimed to answer was when. So when should policymakers advocate for interoperability? Is it at the beginning? Uh, of market development or towards the end when the market is fully formed. And then the third one was on the how. So uh, a lot of you felt that in some payments interoperability is key for financial inclusion, but the question is how can we better optimize that to ensure that we achieve that key goal? We had two hypotheses to begin with, and that is that interoperability doesn't naturally happen, that it takes certain elements for it to happen. It could be the policymaker pushing for it. It could be a matter of competition play where uh, different players feel they need to work together to achieve efficiencies and possibly compete. Then the second one is that interoperability can ultimately lead to financial inclusion and uh, going to, with a theme. And it goes through different avenues. So it could be that it creates a flat platform whereby um, different innovators can be able to reducing the barriers of entry for different innovators to be able to serve the market. And this could allow new players with more innovative business models, cheaper solutions to actually enter the market and uh, provide solutions to the underserved. So just uh, before we move on, I wanted to highlight that we looked at scheme interoperability. We do acknowledge the different ways of interoperating. It could be that um, you have aggregators doing so, or but of our study focused on scheme interoperability. Um, so I mentioned earlier that we looked at key markets. Just a moment, I'm just trying to navigate something here. Mm -hmm. We looked at key markets. The ones in 2020 are highlighted in the green uh, 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 color. And then the ones in, that we looked at in 2021 are highlighted in the mustard color. So we wanted a diversity of schemes. We wanted ones in developed nations, others in developed nations. We wanted ones where the market, the payments uh, market is very well developed versus where others are developing. We wanted older ones versus newer ones, where by like in South Africa, the scheme came up in 2006, whereas in uh, Kenya, the schemes came up in 2018. We also looked at one um, cross-country interoperable scheme, and that's the one for SEPA. So we looked at uh, the instant payment scheme in the SEPA region, whereas all the others were uh, domestic schemes. So we hope that by doing so, we would get a diversity of views uh, to be able to assess trends and see, uh, to be able to answer our three questions. So as it stands, uh, the BIAS published a report last year mentioning that there were 60 schemes that are already in place. As you see, our study looks at 12 out of the 60 schemes that are already in place. So in the recent months, there has been numerous reports coming out around interoperability and particularly in instant payment schemes, looking at trends being seen in different markets. The difference between our project and other projects is that we're really focusing on outcomes as, um, and performance. So fine, these are the trends that are taken in different markets, but what is the ultimate outcome? And can we match the different trends to the outcomes? The chart you see um, sort of looks at the volumes, which is a very common outcome measure for payment systems. It's an obvious measure because it uh, gauges whether the scheme in place is actually being used. And in particular, um, so interoperable schemes are supposed to facilitate off-net transactions. So that is what we looked at. 
then to normalize across the different country populations. So a lot of studies look at um, volumes per capita. We wanted to really uh, normalize and hence we use the volume uh, by the number of financially included adults because this constitutes the addressable market for digital payments. We then wanted to normalize and see the development over time. So we thought that the best way to go about it is to look at from year zero, which is the year of setup, to 2020. So how has that scheme evolved over time? Just because different schemes started at different years. So that can show you, um, uh, uh, I guess the imagined trend from this is that the younger schemes seem to be outperforming the older schemes. You'll see uh, schemes like prompt pay, which came up in 2017, 2018, outperforming ones that came up much earlier, like Canada in 2002 the real-time clearing rail in South Africa, which came up in 2006, where the numbers, the transactions per financially included adult per year have been very, very low. But then you'll see others like Pestalink and Jomope, which are also recent, uh, tend to not have performed really, really well. Um, then, so out volume in outcomes is great, but it does not capture the range of factors affecting performance of skins. Um, so we had to look at um, broaden the scope in terms of performance and look at other levels. So um, you'll see that in the right, um, so in addition to looking at volume of payments, we looked at the different schemes and how they rank against each other. And the ranking was informed by three factors. The first one being stakeholder, what the stakeholders felt. So we spoke to various stakeholders in different markets. We targeted payments regulators. We targeted financial service providers that were participating in the schemes and ones that uh, were not yet participating in the schemes. We spoke to the uh, scheme uh, managers uh, in the different countries. We also spoke to different payment experts that had a good view and an overall view of those particular markets. And we asked them through various polls to give an indication of how they felt about whether the different schemes have met the objectives that were set out in the beginning. And then secondly, have they resulted in benefits to the financial service providers themselves and also to the end users? And then thirdly, whether they expect benefits to ensue in three to five years, because some of them were still pretty recent and developing. Um, that was the one of the ranks that we used. And then the other rank that we used was the effectiveness to the end users. So in, the, in 2020, we did a study again with the Gates Foundation, just looking at what constitutes an inclusive payment and um, also part of their framework. So an inclusive payments account or an inclusive product, a prop poor product would have certain attributes and that is accessibility, affordability and value. So we looked at whether some of these schemes, um, are they accessible? Is the, how is the user experience? Um, do they have features that make it easier for illiterate people to access them, um, such as requests to pay, a proxy addressing and so on and so forth. We also looked at the cost. Um, so is it near zero? in terms of um, is affordability a barrier? And then we also looked at value. So value being the more uses you can use, the, you can actually uh, employ in terms of making payments using this scheme, the more value you'd, you'd have. Can you pay merchants? Can you pay the government and, and others? Then the, in terms of arriving at the, uh, uh, the ranking that you now see, we also adjusted for some. So there are some we adjusted up, there's some we adjusted downwards. An example of a scheme we adjusted downwards, and it would be great to get the feedback if there's anyone from Tanzania who's uh, in this uh, webinar. So Taifa Moja, so the scheme between in, um, mobile money players in Tanzania, we uh, downgraded or rather brought it down. The overall score, average score was three, but we brought it down to a two, as you can see. And the reasons is, we realized that along the way, the, the stakeholders were able to speak to our stakeholders that were involved at the very early stages. We were not able to get a good representation of stakeholders who are still involved in the scheme. And what we saw is that the pricing, which was one of the key scheme rules, so there was not supposed to be a surcharge, they were supposed to have the same pricing for off-net and on-net transaction, that has fallen away 
based on the tariffs that we saw published on the different websites. And uh, that would mean that there was a governance concern. So we brought that down as it was a key factor and a key determinant of the scheme. Another one that we ranked down was Jomo Pay. So stakeholders were very uh, positive about the scheme. But uh, the reason for the downgrade is that the, uh, the, the inception of the scheme, um, the way it was done was also, uh, also stopped or rather put a halt to the implementation of mobile money in Jordan. Uh, it led to delays because of the standards that were imposed on the different financial service providers. So those are some of the reasons, but actually the ones that are top performing, we did not uh, upgrade or downgrade in any way. The scores are as the averages that, were, that came about. So now that we have looked at the outcomes, I guess the next step would be looking at the inputs and particularly what was the policymaker's role in achieving the different outcomes. So this table sort of shows that the different degrees that a policymaker can play, and it varies uh, depending on the country that you're evaluating. Um, so, and when we talk about policymakers, we're not just talking about the traditional payments regulator, such as the central bank, who is the payments regulator in a lot of countries. So some of them, there are different types of policymakers. Like in the UK, there was payment system regulator, who is also involved in promoting competition in the payment space and in the financial, financial space. In India and Canada, we saw involvement by the Ministry of Finance. They, they had authority over financial service providers and how the schemes implemented different rules, um, more so to push them towards some form of public interest objectives. So based on the 12 jurisdictions we looked at, we determined that interoperability is like a dance. And the regulator can sit out and hope that the stakeholders dance together, or she can take various active steps to ensure that stakeholders dance together and are well coordinated. And that's the spectrum that you see um, or, uh, uh, that is shown in that particular chart. So in the on to the far left, we saw four categories of that spectrum. So we needed to come up with some a framework that you, you can sort of place them in. And we came up with four categories. So watch the dance tap your feet, dance the ballroom, or command the match. And then to the extreme right, you see how the, the various uh, policymakers can be involved in terms of ownership, the uh, ownership of the scheme and the infrastructure involved. So I'm sure you're wondering what all this means. And the first one for watch the dance. So we determined that this could be where the policymaker has endorsed the scheme or provides oversight where, um, where it's applicable Tap your feet is more about the policymaker has been involved to some extent, more actively involved, whereby they provided uh, the facilitated research that could inform the industry or they uh, uh, provided a conducive environment for the different players to coordinate and work together. The third one is dance the ballroom, where we see the policymakers there setting a clear vision, a roadmap continuously convening the industry so they can work together by setting the tempo so the objectives can be achieved in good time, consistently monitoring and making adjustments or prompting the industry to make adjustments through various nudges. Um, and then uh, sometimes you see them imposing prescriptive conditions to make sure that public policy objectives are met. Um, and then in command the match, this is where we saw ex ante mandates. So what we mean by ex ante mandates is whereby the policymaker determines that this needs to be achieved by the industry and puts out a mandate without consulting or proper consultation of the industry. And is very prescriptive in terms of what must be achieved, how it must be achieved um, and so on and so forth. So I guess, um, this is how we mapped out the different schemes in terms of the policymakers' involvement. And we see various clusters beginning to form. So we see that successful, we see the cluster on the far left in Watch the Dance. We see the one in Dance the Ballroom where those ones tend to exceed expectations or meet expectations. And then we see another cluster in Command the Match where we, we determine those ones not to be very effective. So, in terms of the successful schemes, um, they have demonstrated the importance of the regulator, both 
as a visionary in setting the guiding star to the players and an ultimate enforcer that balances the autonomy and accountability of the providers to create sustainable solutions. So um, we, for instance, will, it, so in that particular category, we saw it was a dance between the regulator and the industry where the regulator was the lead dancer, but the industry players had the ability to choose the different steps that they had to take. And in some cases, once the steps were selected or were chosen by the industry, then the regulator would come back and codify those into mandates, which we called ex post mandates. This happened in, in countries like uh, Philippines, which has a mandate, but it came after the very um, deep and long conversations and consultation with the industry. We also saw that in Ghana, when we spoke to stakeholders in Ghana, although there's a mandate, when we asked them, they're like, no, nah, it's not a mandate. We just put together what we agreed uh, when we had those different consultations. So you'll see a difference in terms of attitudes to how the different stakeholders feel about their engagement. Um, an example, I guess, again, to just give an, um, get more into detail is UPI. I cannot pick every country, but I'll pick just to give you a, a sense. So in terms of UPI, um, you'll see that the, the RBI set up, uh, put together or rather convened the India Bankers Association, um, requesting them to form NPCI or putting them together to form an NP NPCI. Um, and then um, also made NPCI more sustainable, gave infrastructure that made NPCI more sustainable in its role over the years. And then others could argue that RBI was not involved in UPI, but it, was, it has been highlighted by stakeholders that one of the great champions for that particular scheme was actually the RBI governor, who at the time uh, was very involved, was pushing for faster payments, had seen it happen in other countries. And after that, there was a vision that laid out some of the specifications or some of the guidance for the industry to put together. It guided the industry in forming or in creating UPI. And then over time, you've seen the Ministry of Finance come in at various angles. They required that there be no charge to the end consumer, and they required that there be no merchant discount rates for the uh, merchant payments. Um, to counteract that, or rather to uh, uh, having monitored the industry and how it's evolving over time, we, just recently in 2021, there was a fund put out by the RBI, which went to compensate the banks because of the losses, uh, because of this public policy objective that was put out by the Ministry of Finance. So you see that um, they were there in the beginning and they've continuously been involved over time. So in the extreme left, where the regulators sat back by providing approvals and oversight. So in Kenya particularly, our regulator is well known for wanting the industry to provide its own solutions. Um, I guess a scheme like PESALINK, although has, um, has met some objectives, still needs improvement. And that goes, uh, it's the same case for Taifa Moja, which is an interoperable scheme uh, for mobile money players in Tanzania. Uh, and hence the reason why TIPS is, uh, is coming up. Then on the right, so under command the match. So this was some of the quite early schemes. So EaseWitch was one that was implemented in Ghana before um, it was a card network. The regulator felt that it would solve for financial inclusion. It had biometrics so it could accommodate uh, people that were less literate. It um, accommodated factors like low connectivity, but at the end of the day, it became a white elephant because there was no buying from the industry. It was expensive for the industry to implement. And um, after a few years, there's been no traction in terms of its use. JomoPay, as I mentioned, so was quite prescriptive. It um, included the standards that should be implemented from day one. It came at a point where before mobile money was launched, um, but then it required that mobile money players actually fulfill all the requirements before they could be licensed. So we saw that once it was implemented, it actually took two, another two years for the mobile money players to regroup and then launch mobile money, which slowed down uptake. And mobile, num mobile num money numbers in Jordan have, as a result, suffered or have not risen to the expected levels. On the right, when we look about uh, on when we look at ownership, we don't really see trends. 
um, in terms of whether a scheme would be successful or not in achieving interoperability. So I guess the, what I could highlight is that successful schemes have demonstrated the importance of the regulator um, throughout. So I'm just looking at time to make sure that we are um, flowing well. So the second question was when to advocate for interoperability. So there's been a World Bank study just recently re released that was looking at readiness for different frameworks for setting up retail instant payments across the world. And it sort of touched on when do you set up new instant payments and it's, you need to look at the size of the addressable markets for digital payments. Well, the framework is indeed valid um, and um, it, it, it holds to conventional view based on empirical studies, but Sometimes, uh, but in our study, we saw that uh, there are examples where the, the views that we saw challenged the nat natural evolution. So it, the study proposed that over time, the market may be more ready to interoperate, and maybe that's when you should implement a new instant payment scheme. But sometimes that may never happen, and the question comes in. So what I'd like to highlight in this particular um, graph is that we look at different markets that are in the low level of where the it's the low level of development, and that's where we say it's not that do not don't stand off, uh, but exercise caution, because at early stages of market development then incentives for financial providers and their capacity to implement may not be aligned and they may be more fragile. So if you impose interoperability too early, it may stifle incentives. So this, are the, this is at a point where different uh, providers are actually trying to form a market, trying to reach a point where they are profitable. By imposing interoperability, it may reduce that incentive to want to form the market and that may actually break the market. So exercise caution. Then we see at the mid range, so you may choose to intervene, but consider that there are alternatives. So they could be aggregators who could better do it. So allow for aggregators to come and interoperate the market. Um, and some players may naturally evolve and interoperate. We saw the forms of Pesalink um, banks finally coming together and forming a scheme where they wanted to work together and facilitate payments across. Um, and this, we see that natural development. So there's a natural progression to want to interoperate as the market matures. However, the market may never uh, naturally interoperate. And that's where you get um, dominant players at the end of the, um, the play. So we see markets like Canada having Interac as a dominant player. They're trying to implement an, an RTR scheme to level the playing field for smaller players, but that has proved to be quite, um, quite a task, a mammoth task. We also saw that happening in Kenya, whereby um, the mobile money interoperable scheme has not necessarily facilitated schemes, uh, facilitated transactions from the smaller players. Um, so yeah, so uh, in terms of um, what I would want to highlight for this particular slide is that some form of regulatory pressure towards effective interoperability may be needed at all stages of the market development. Provide the tempo as a regulator, and the tempo is, it goes beyond providing a vision document. So it goes to the point of providing a roadmap that is informed by extensive consultation and discussion and uh, providing a credible route to enhanced interoperability. So the roadmap needs to harness incentives as well as provide for threats and mandates or penalties to get the industry moving and progressing um, as the market develops. So it's creating that fine balance um, in, the, in, the, in the market. And the third question, so it's, it's about optimizing interoperability. So interoperability can indeed lead to financial inclusion in some ways. So how do we optimize this? So in this, um, so in this particular slide, I'd want to highlight that an effective IPS drives um, uh, usage. So that's evidence we saw in different markets. Usage is likely to happen. We did demand side studies in uh, East Africa, particularly Tanzania, and we saw that following the interoperable scheme, 
uh, interoperable users were more likely to have um, digital money in their wallets, and they were more likely to be more frequent users of digital payments. But the question comes in on whether it drives access. And that is um, one of the reasons why we wanted to evaluate more than just six countries to try and see if there's evidence around that. So we saw that there is some evidence that it could actually indeed drive access so uh, to the underserved segments of the market. And this is where it allows uh, different players with different business models that are better suited for serving that particular segment to actually participate. Um, and then this is evidence we saw in Thailand and we saw in Philippines, uh, whereby they included incumbent, non incumbent players um, to the uh, scheme. So in, Philipp in Thailand, actually, that has locked out um, EMIs, but in Philippines, we saw the, uh, that it included incumbent player, sorry, non-traditional players into the scheme. Uh, and this has facilitated broader interoperability. So just uh, a broader um, um, benefit to the market. So just to give you an example, so on the extreme left was a statement by Gcash, which is the largest, um, facilitates the largest volumes in the Philippines market. Um, they are an EMI, they are non-bank player, and they felt that interoperability really has benefited them as an entity and has better equipped them in terms of serving the lower segment, which the banks were not interested. So um, the way it, uh, it has done that is that, number one, they were able to better, more sustainably load their wallets. So initially they had to set up different agent networks to load their wallets, but because of interoperability, funds can move from the bank to their different wallets, which makes it even cheaper. And then secondly, it builds trust. So the fact uh, when they started initially, they did not allow customers to send out money from their network to other networks. And then when they, they realized that when they switched on that function, because customers felt that they could easily send, they, it built trust in the system and their uh, transactions dramatically grew. And then um, just going on, some of the assessment we've done for the Philippines shows that financial inclusion has indeed grown. In 2017, the um, number, formal account ownership was at 22.6%. When we looked in 2021, that had increased to 53%. And the reason why that has increased according to the uh, BSP, which is uh, uh, the, the central bank of the Philippines is because of EMIs. So the wallets that have been set up or have been opened by EMIs, uh, they attribute that to be the re biggest reason why financial inclusion has grown. So I guess this led us to want to come up with a framework about how schemes um, can, better, can better include or can better facilitate financial inclusion. And we see that, so in terms of ordering schemes from left to right, they are ordered according to how they've evolved over time or when they were launched. And we've seen, we can see that they've gotten better over time. So just going back to the framework, so we wanted to come up with, um, in terms of financial inclusion or financial inclusion usage and access, I had mentioned that we had different criteria through various studies that we've done around facilitating access, value, accessibility, and affordability. But in so much based on the evidence that we've gotten, when you allow non-bank players or non-traditional players that have better business models to serve the underserved, then you are more likely to have a propensity to financially include. And when we talk about participation, so it's not just about participating in the clearing, but also in the decision making. Because with some of the schemes, we've seen that um, non-bank players or non-traditional players can participate, but, the, but their voices do not necessarily translate to the rules, which can ultimately deter or uh, uh, deter what they could achieve. Uh, based on that particular criteria, so you'll see that the propensity for financial inclusion score was based on the six items or the six criteria that is listed below. So the could entities participate in that particular market? Yes or no? No. Are they involved in their rulemaking? So we looked at the governance structures in the schemes. Um, do they actually have a voice in the rulemaking? 
And then the others we felt that were quite necessary was USSD. So as much as smartphones are becoming ubiquitous, there are still markets where the excluded cannot afford the actual smartphones and so still need to be included. For instance, in Philippines, we saw that a large segment actually um, about 60, uh, around 60%, uh, uh, 53% of Filipinos were using the internet, yet 69% of adults mentioned that they have phones, meaning that there's still a gap between those ones that are, are, can actually access apps and applications on smartphones versus those ones that have basic phones. Then the other aspect about accessibility that could be um, considered is the user experience, whereby some interoperable options are hidden within menus um, and not uh, directly available. The other aspect is use cases. So we, we, would, we saw that a lot of schemes that had actually achieved tremendous numbers or benefits to the industry had moved beyond the P2P um, use case towards the merchant payment use case. A lot of them stayed within the P2P use case for a long time and actually there was a call for support, support to some of the schemes because it becomes more complicated in terms of aligning incentives. But the reason we uh, pushed for the P2M is because when we perform payment diagnostic studies in various countries, we saw that this is a large segment of payments um, falls under that particular bracket. So if you're not accommodating it in the digital payments, then you're leaving a huge uh, opportunity. For instance, in Ghana, we saw that P2M transactions um, account for 80% of the transactions in that particular market. So digitizing that or in, including that in the in interoperable payments is a big win. Then in terms of accessibility, so there are certain features that make it easier for illiterate or the underserved to better participate uh, in, some, in digital payments. And that, those could be features like proxy addressing, whereby you don't have to remember someone's account number, but can use a number or an ID that, you, that is memorable or even the request to pay functionality where the payment is initiated by the person receiving the payment and the process becomes shorter for the, uh, for the payer. Then in terms of fees I had mentioned earlier, so fees must not be prohibitive. And we, in our scale, we looked at uh, fee, whereby fees are less than 1%. And some of the schemes that actually qualified for that were for instance, Ghana that has recently um, revised its uh, fees and the likes of UPI that have zero, zero, trans zero fees and Jomo pay. Then at the end of the day, I guess the most, one of the important things to note is that you can have everything going for you in terms of this uh, criteria, but when push comes to shove, it can have, the policymaker can actually um, mess it up for lack of better words in terms of how the schemes are implemented and the ultimate results may not be achieved because of the mode of implementation by the policymaker. So in terms of looking forward, uh, we've seen that, um, sorry, there are certain disruptive trends that are happening. So we saw that the domestic, uh, the different instant payment scheme is becoming the norm with the number increasing. Sorry, I should have changed this to 60 according to the BIS study that was published. But there's also been a rise of retail stable coins and a rise of central bank digital currencies that could actually impact um, the move towards digital payment. So we've seen that um, they are certain uh, and this cannot be ignored over time because they'll either pull attention towards um, the development of this. So we've seen a lot of central banks actually being involved and um, putting out frameworks around CBDCs. We've seen Nigeria actually launched uh, in Naira um, a couple of months ago. Um, and so these trends cannot be involved in terms of how they will impact the rollout of um, digital instant, instant payments going forward. So in terms of key takeaways, I would like to highlight that be very clear as a regulator on what problem you're trying to solve. Is it a competition problem? Is it an infrastructure problem? Is it a coordination problem? Then secondly, dancing lessons may help to establish a better rhythm. 
So you need to create a tempo for the industry to move together and uh, towards the aligned goals. And um, the third one is consider managed interoperability, whereby hold off being very prescriptive, let the industry uh, decide what options or the different, um, um, uh, the different options they want to employ. But at the same time, when um, there are certain, uh, there are certain times that the policymaker will have to be prescriptive in terms of achieving public policy goals um, and so on. And then in monitoring, so monitor the progress. So we found that it was quite difficult to actually get some of these numbers for some of the schemes. It was difficult to get information about how they've um, benefited the industry at large and the end users. And therefore we call for a, a framework to actually monitor how these different schemes are being implemented and what they're achieving over time to be able to make informed decisions when um, changes need to be done. And then the last one is that it's never one and done. So it, it, it pays to be involved in the setup. It pays to be actively involved in the setup, but the work does not end there. So as you monitor the progress and as you monitor the progress towards the outlined objectives, then you still need to be just as, in, as involved to make sure that you keep the industry um, in the same rhythm and towards the, the common goal. For a broader IAPS implementers, so I would want to highlight that prioritize the P2M use case. The opportunity lies in that. So a lot of the uh, schemes were stuck at P2P. Uh, so progression to P2M would create wider network effects and more value for the industry. Then keep a close eye on emerging trends around CBDCs and also stable coins and how they will affect instant payments going into the future. And then the last one is, uh, as I call for, a monitoring framework for inclusive, out uh, for inclusive outcomes. So yeah, thanks, thanks very much. I'd like to open up the floor to questions. I see we have about 15 minutes. Perfect. Thank you so much, Shirley. And, and wow, what a huge piece of work. I know we'd hoped to squeeze you into the webinar series earlier, but I can see now with the volume of work and research and thought that has gone into this, why it's taken um, a little bit longer for you to disseminate and, 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 and give these sort of insights. I mean, there's, there's huge pieces of work there. Um, so I'm going to try and, and get through with you as many of the questions that we can um, before, before we end the time. But obviously, we'll also put your contact details, um, A, they're on the screen now, but B, they'll also be sent with the email of the recording that we'll send on Thursday so people can reach out to you if we don't get around to everyone's questions. So I'm, I'm gonna start with, um, with, with one of David Cracknell's questions, um, and, and he's had a few, so great. Thank you, David, so much for being engaged in this, uh, in this webinar. Um, and his question was similar to mine. So, you know, the, the spectrum of what's happening with regulators, you know, what he's seeing and, and what I think we're generally feeling is that, that you know, they are becoming more interventionist, um, you know, and, and being more engaged. So you talked about the dance and I love that analogy. So how do we, you know, how can we encourage what kind of things do, can, can we do or regulators, you know, do to try and manage and, 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 and sort of lead nicely that dance? Yeah. So I guess the, word, the, the answer is in the words that you used, Sarah, and it's around managed interoperability. I guess one of the things the study has called for is that the regulator can't sit back. We've seen that uh, the, the effects or the outcomes have not been so great when the regulator sits back. Um, you may allow the market to evolve over time, but then you may reach a point whereby the, you have a dominant player and the market is not being as innovative or is not including other newer players. So we know that the payment space is quite dynamic. So you may have a scheme that starts with all players in the industry, but then over time, new players emerge. So whose role is it to include them or to push for their inclusion in that particular scheme for the benefits of the underserved or the greater good of the market? So it's a matter of being involved, actively being involved, but at the same time, holding off the prescription. So in terms of have consultations to understand the incentives for the different players, what works for the different players, Yes, there may be compromises because what works for the greater good of the market may not necessarily work for the different players. But when you carry the industry along, 
and know where to pick your battles. <laughs> and um, then it becomes more of a managed interoperable process where um, the different stakeholders are brought along and are incentivized to participate and continue to provide inclusive instant payments. I guess look, looking to a very old analogy, it's about managing the carrot and the stick. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so the carrots and the sticks have to be there. And it could be more, of, so we saw where there are post, post um, mandates that come after, but it could be also a threat of, the, of a mandate. So you're not working together or we want you to work together now, but by year three, we'll have to mandate. Then you sort of give a roadmap or give direction to the industry more actively and they know what they're working towards too. Well, giving them enough time to be able to change their infrastructure, giving them enough time to be able to prove a business case. Because we saw various, like in Philippines, um, the, we saw various uh, players or banks mentioning that we initially did not want EMIs to participate in the same scheme as us. But over time, we realized we are serving different markets. So uh, they're serving the underserved, they're serving the banked. So it could be a matter of allowing the market to move and moving along with the market, but making sure that you create the tempo and provide the direction. Great, and you sort of answered one of the other questions as well, but you know, I, I will ask it again in case there is an, another example that you can give us, but is when, if ever, should a regulator mandate interoperability? <laughs> That's interesting. So I guess I would say the regulator should mandate interoperability when there's been effective consultation with the industry. So in cases where you just codifying what the agreement with the industry has been. And it doesn't mean that when you codify, changes may not happen after. I understand like in Ghana, it was codified and they started with a sender pays model. But over time, they've realized that that actually is at the detriment of smaller players. And that was the, the regulator recently uh, pulled the industry together and that has been changed to a receiver pays model. But you can see then that way it's not harmful to the industry or um, everyone is aligned. The second one I would say is when there is a dominant player, then the regulator needs to take action um, at that particular point. But then it comes down to how do you take action? And yeah, in those particular categories, it can be quite complicated and complex. And we've seen better results when the competition's regulator is actually uh, involved in taking that particular action um, together with the payments regulator, but uh, it may be more of a specialized role in that particular instance, such as, uh, such as in the UK. Well, I think we sort of touched on answering um, Anne's question there about how you deal with um, monopolies. So, I mean, yeah, you know, we're not going to give a long prescriptive answer, but but obviously trying to, to reduce the impact of that monopoly being being one through, as you said, regulation or competitions authorities. Um, and I think that also sort of start to touch on another question that came in from from David. Um, he brings up the example of, of you know, Tan Tanzania, where you know, MMO interoperability, you know, is part possible because of relatively even market share. So we've got almost the exact opposite now. Um, um, you know, so how does, you know, is that a good example there? Or, you know, what sort of thoughts would you give? You know, is it, is, is it very, is interoperability and the view of interoperability context dependent? You know, so we'd look at Kenya and Tanz you know, Tanzania as, as incredibly different examples of that. Um, so I, I guess I, I'm just looking at uh, David's question. Um, I've missed that particular question, but I guess that's the example of as the market evolves, then players are more likely to come together. So players with an even market share and see benefits of the benefits of interoperating become very clear or more clear. So in terms of Tanzania, I believe that different uh, players were concentrated in different regions. And so they saw value in expanding the pool by interoperating because then they would serve uh, a larger segment in regions where they were not well represented. We also saw the same in Canada. Canada is a large, um, large market with few players serving a very broad space. 
So how interoperability started there is by setting up um, ATM networks. You couldn't do it in every single location in Canada, and they saw value in, in, in creating interoperability in that particular payment system. So there is that progression after you've developed the market. So again, by the time interoperability happened in Tanzania, it was quite a, a fairly mature market by that point. They were all established in their own uh, regions. And so they saw the value to actually come together and expand that pool. So it does happen. So you know, if we're expecting people to come together and, and you know play together in, you know, which is what interoperability is all about, there, there has to be sort of you know, incentives and reasons and, and to understand you know, what those are. Um, and I guess what I'm hearing, you know, Shelley, is you know, actually the, the it's great when the industry find those commonalities themselves. It's you know, as opposed to being forced, you know, it, it, to play together. As you said, sort of the you know, the mandates not always helpful. Um, you know, if we can sort of allow it to kind of bubble up and 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 you know, and then the the regulators support that bubbling and collaboration in some way. That seems to be a way to manage that dance that you were talking about. Yeah, um, and even when they come together, I guess it's not a reason for the regulator to sit it out. Um, the regulator still needs to be involved because the industry, what we've seen is that schemes today evolve over time. So it could be a scheme of participants who are in the market today, but what happens five years down the line when new players are trying to get into the market and serve the same base with better uh, services or with higher propositions? then that's why the regulator needs to um, make sure that the schemes move as the market changes. As you say, so as, as one of your points you made on one of your slides, you know, you're never one and done. It's a continuous evolution process um, as, as new services, as new competitors and players come, um, then, then the systems are going to need to be continually updated and changed and evolve over time. Mm -hmm. and, and picking up on your point, so, you know, I found it really interesting as well, the, the ideas that you had around, you know, sort of say when we talk about, you know, instant and interoperable, we make an assumption that that means that we're going to increase financial inclusion. And as we've seen, that isn't a necessarily a correct assumption that we can, we can, we can make. Um, and you gave us some ideas there um, in terms of use cases and expanding use cases, you know, access, accessibility. How would you how you know what else you know what would you advise people from that you know and, and and monitoring also is quite is quite a challenge so what do you feel are the next steps you know who who should be monitoring should there be a global framework how do we how do we really you know uh, try and understand the impact of, of our IPS systems yeah so I guess you 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 yeah one of the key aspects is that we assume that instant payments will be inclusive and will therefore um, expand and serve the underserved, but we saw that that may not necessarily happen. So what with interoperability, you basically, the, the direct impact is that you provide value for the people within the network, and those are the people who are already included. So in terms of expanding reach, it means that um, new players need to come in and actually serve those segments, or affordability needs to drop, or the value proposition needs to be higher to attract the underserved. Um, in terms of the next steps or calling to action for monitoring and making sure that that key objective is achieved, the key objective of financial inclusion, I guess with, um, the regulators that are pushing for the different schemes, different regulators have various objectives. So some of them may not track the aspect of inclusion because it was not an objective of the scheme. Sometimes it could be just you want to promote digital payments. Um, financial inclusion becomes, as a, becomes an afterthought, whereas in others, it was part of the objective, but may never be achieved. Like Jomope, financial inclusion was an objective, but we saw that mobile money, into, uh, mobile money has not necessarily uh, grown in terms of serving and including the underserved. So it's more of calling on entities that are responsible for pushing instant payment schemes, the likes of Africa Nenda, uh, the, the likes of regulators um, to actually come up with frameworks that could incorporate this. It could be a matter of including certain questions that monitor this from a demand side perspective in, in the FinDEC service. It could be a matter of a test check 
uh, in the industry by speaking to various stakeholders and looking at the volumes and the numbers and where they don't translate then taking action. So it's, um, it, it's a collective effort, but it's also a consultative pro uh, effort for both a demand side, having both a demand side and a supply side view. And you know that's really clear what's coming across in your research you know, is, you, is you try to look at the, the, the schemes from multiple perspectives, the user's perspectives, you know, the regulator, private sector, and, and that's got to give the, the, the whole view, right, holistic view that we're looking at here, not just you know, whether, you know, what, what exists on, on paper. And, and I, you know, I know you mentioned a few people there, and I know I know for sure that, for example, we've got uh, a couple of the, the those teams that you mentioned on the call today. So I, I would hope that we can continue that conversation about developing that framework and understanding the impact um, of, of IPS systems. We've got one more minute, so I'm going to squeeze one last question in, which I think is quite um, interesting. I'm just trying to flick through which I think we haven't got round to. I think we'll pick on the last um, question, which is from Jeremy Gray. Um, so are there any learnings that could emerge from the process of interoperability um, of infrastructure that could be extrapolated into learning about improbability of, of data, so things around banking, um, open finance, which are also trends that are emerging? Okay. Um, so any thoughts there, Shirley? Yeah, we did look at infrastructure as uh, being an enabler for interoperability. And I guess our conclusion was that at the end of the day, infrastructure is key, but it's not the most important. The rules and the governance need, um, I, I would say, are at a higher standing. They need to be in place because you have to align incentives for coordination before you even get into the infrastructure. So having an infrastructure-led approach may actually lead to detrimental results if the incentives are not aligned and if the governance structure to ensure that the incent the, the rules that were agreed upon uh, continue to be implemented or changed accordingly over time. Great, so that actually the infrastructure is, is, is one of, but many things to think about in the, in the, in the scheme. And, and I guess that's what makes it so difficult, right? Lots of angles, lots of aspects and lots of stakeholders. And we know yeah. that, that the more stakeholders you put into a pot, the more difficult sometimes, you know, managing that collaboration can be. Yeah, and we've seen various schemes take off without infrastructure being in place um, and actually do well over time having their own infrastructure in place. Uh, more of outsourcing uh, has been one of the trends that is emerging, um, or even um, by lacking a common infrastructure. Well, I mean, there's so many comments, Shirley, about saying great presentation, great insights. Thank you so much. And I, I know we've only scratched the surface because I'm sure there are there's much more to read in your reports and the blogs that are going to come out. So um, we will connect. We will connect all the links that are currently available and publicly available to everybody on the email that comes around with the recording. Um, and then we'll also continue to have this conversation. I think it's a really fascinating conversation. Um, instant and interoperable payment systems is definitely Definitely something that we'll be talking about and, and not just us but other players um, like you mentioned African Ender in the space so there's going to be lots of conversation coming up. Shelley thank you so much there's just a wealth of information that you've, you've shared with us in one hour I can't quite believe how much you covered in that time it's been such a pleasure to have you on the webinar series um, and I'm really excited to read more about the study that you've done and, uh, and, and learn more of the insights. Thanks, Sarah, for your time. And I highly encourage anyone who wants to get into in-depth details to look out for our blogs um, and decks coming out towards the end of this month. Perfect. We'll Thank also you. make sure we send everybody those links as well. Yes, we'll do that. Thank, Thank you, you, Shirley. Thank you to everybody who asked lots of questions. I'm sorry we didn't get around to all of them, but I really hope that uh, we've answered as many of them as we can. Um, take care, everybody, and uh, we'll see you on a webinar again soon. Bye, everyone. Bye. Hey.